sing on a dime, amen. All right, so let's grab our Bibles, go to Genesis 39, Genesis 39 again, and actually make your way over to Genesis 37, Genesis 37. You know, as we read about Joseph, I want to make one thing clear, especially Joseph, especially for the first 35 years or so of his life, he had a very rough life, very rough life, but including God, but a lot of times it's because of the choices we've made in the past. I mean, a lot of times health issues are uh, because of poor choices in the past, and that's not, not every time, of course, but that can happen. Um, there's so many different uh, things in our life that happen, and you've got to look back. It's like, well, you know what? That was due to a poor choice of mine, but Joseph right here, he didn't choose any of this. He just went through a rough life, and let's read about this right here in Genesis 37. <coughs> And uh, verse 1, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billa and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto, fa unto his father their evil report. Now Israel, which was Jacob, and he was called Israel by God. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age, and me made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. You want to make your, your special kid really unpopular? Show, it, show every, all your other kids that you love him more, amen? So that's going to that's gonna really make him feel really loved and special. So did Joseph choose to be the favorite? No, of course not. But here he was <clears throat> set up as a target for all of his older brothers to absolutely hate his guts. And look at this right here, verse 5. And to top that off, the Lord sends Joseph a couple dreams. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. <coughs> and behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now I'm just trying to wonder if he was just a little naive, but he continued, and he dreamed another dream. And instead of keeping this one to himself, he decided to tell his brothers again, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me, bowed down to him. And he told it to his father as well and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. So you can see Joseph had a rough childhood in a way that he had a lot of animosity against him in his family. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a bad home situation, and some of you have as kids, you grew up in a bad home situation, you can kind of relate to what Joseph was going through in terms of just uh, animosity in family. You know, you expect that from, you know, going out in the world and stuff and going to school and going to workplace and stuff like that. But when you come home, you want to have a place of what? Peace, quiet, protection. And Joseph just didn't have that. Um, unless he was around his dad, everywhere else he was hated. Everywhere else he was uh, abused verbally, and no doubt physically sometimes as well. And if you look at this right here, and uh, let's look at verse 14, or verse 13. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And again, you see Joseph's obedience right there. Joseph knew his brother and hated him, but when his dad told him to go feed, go check on his brethren, without question, Joseph went. And I love that obedience out of him. And verse 15, and a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence. For I heard they say, let us go to Dothan. 
And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And we see later on that Joseph is greatly used by God. But before God can greatly use you, you have to also obey uh, earthly authority first. And when you're obeying earthly authority, and I kind of geared this toward the teenagers the other day, until they can start obeying mom and dad, how can they, God ever expect them to obey God when God has a purpose? And the same for you as well. If you won't, if you won't listen to your preacher's advice, why would God think you'd ever listen to him when he at, reaches out to you? Think about that right there. And uh, God's never going to, well, God never speaks to me. Well, God's trying to use the pastor to speak to, amen? God's trying to use his word to speak to you. Are you listening? Are you obeying? And how can God ever use you if you just won't start simply obeying the book and obeying the preacher and being in a church, bless God? And uh, yeah, and so I encourage you right here, before God can ever use us, before God can ever uh, just really make a difference in our life and use our life to make a difference in others, we, we've got to be able to do the, the simple obedience first, just like Joseph did. And look at this right here. And uh, verse 18, look at verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. It's pretty horrific how, no doubt, they didn't start out this way, but they allowed bitterness to just keep creeping in and creeping in and creeping in until finally it just consumed to the point that they wanted to kill their own little brother. And again, Joseph might have been like 13, 14 years old. And all of these young, these were older guys, a lot of them up into their 30s, because uh, he had 10 older brothers. And they were willing to kill a 13, 14 year old boy because they had allowed bitterness to consume them that strongly that they hated a 13 year old boy. That tells you how danger, dangerous bitterness is. And I'm just kind of reading through this passage right here, but who are you bitter against right now? Who have you not forgiven? Think about that right there. Is there something, is there someone in your life that you have not forgiven, that you are allowing, you're hanging on to? And the only person you're making miserable, is they may not even know that you hate their guts. Yeah. And even if they do, they're probably not going to let your hate keep them up at night. But you are over there dwelling and cons being consumed with that bitterness. How long are you going to hang on to that? Let it go. Let it go. Get right. And look at this right here. And they saw him before, afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Verse 19, they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto uh, them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and no, lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to the, his father again. So Reuben had a little bit of a heart. Verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from, coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. How generous of them. Instead of killing them, they're going to sell them into slavery, which much better lifestyle, right? Much better choice right there. Yeah, he's going to be treated so well. And it just tells you how bitterness has just completely warped their mind, ruined them as men. And then they're passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Can you imagine the screams, he, the weeping and the screams of Joseph as he was taken out of that pit and sold to complete strangers, begging his brothers to think twice, don't, don't do this to me, I love you. Can you imagine the, the pain, the betrayal, the horror he must have been going through? Sure, he knew his brothers couldn't stand his guts, yeah, of course, but to have them do this to him, I mean, pretty brutal, pretty brutal, what he went through. And then to top it off like this, this is that these messed up sons take his coat, rip it up, 
covered it in goat's blood and then take it to their dad and say, what do you think, what do you think happened? And let their father believe that he had been killed by a wild animal and left their old father just weeping in ashes. And I mean, just how messed up bitterness had created them to be. And look at this right here, but I want to really focus on Joseph's response on going through hard times. Genesis 39, and we read this already, but Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with who? And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with who? And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over all this house and all that he had put into his hand. <coughs> Joseph didn't allow his bad circumstances to bring his spirit down and to, and to make him completely useless for the Lord. He allowed this. He, he kept, he, the Lord was still with, could the Lord be with Joseph? He was bitter, angry, miserable. No, he couldn't have been because God doesn't dwell with sin. But Joseph here, Joseph had the Lord with him and he was a prosperous man because of it. And let's keep reading right here. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he, left at all the, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught that he had, save the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. So he went from a slave to an overseer over all this Egyptian's house, over all the Egyptians in this leader's house, because he decided, you know what, God, I'm in a bad situation, but I'm going to let you use me anyways. And uh, I'm going to make the best of my situation. I'm not like, going to let my spirit be down. I'm not going to be miserable in this bad situation. I'm going to have a smile on my face. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the best of what I'm going through right now. Hey, I'm in the valley, but guess what? You're with me. Let me go, let's go to Psalm 23 right there, Psalm 23. Amen. Go to Psalm 23. Very familiar passage. I mean, even people that really have no church experience know this passage. It's just so familiar, written all over the place. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He make excuse me. <coughs> he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's David, uh, the, the, the shepherd boy David, the, the King David, the one who slew Goliath, talking about how no matter what, that God, even amongst his enemies, God's going to set a table before him and just take care of him. And then David said, my cup runneth over. Hey, I can still be happy in bad times, amen. I don't have to let my circumstances make me miserable. I don't have to let bad health make me a miserable person. I don't have to let family issues make me a miserable person. I don't have to let job loss make me a miserable person. I don't have to let anything in this life make me a miserable person. Why? Because I have Jesus, amen. And if you have Jesus, you have a peace that passeth all understanding. And how do I have Jesus? By asking him to come into my heart and be my savior and take away my sins because I gave my life to him. And I am his and he is mine. And so even though I'm hacking up here, hey, I'm having a good time, amen. It may not look like it, but hey, I'm, I'm having a good time. It's good to be in God's house today. You decide what kind of circumstance, what kind of happiness you're going to have. In, in bad circumstances, good circumstances, you decide. Just like when you come to church as well, you can either decide it's going to be a miserable experience or a happy experience. And the same with your kids as well. Like you want your kids going to school excited to learn, right? You don't want them to go there just like, ah, I don't want it. You want them to have the right mindset. You have to have the right mindset in life too. Every day, have the right mindset. If you know what, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. And Joseph had the right mindset that, you know what, God, no matter what happens, no matter what I go through, 
I'm going to stay close to you, and I'm going to let you lead me and guide me, and I'm going to keep a smile on my face. And guess what? People noticed. Joseph's slave master noticed and put him in charge over his entire household, gave him authority over everyone, including men that weren't even slaves. Why? Because Joseph allowed God, uh, just allowed God to stay in his life. He allowed God to have control over him even during the bad times, and he kept his spirit. He kept his spirit. Look at this right here. And last time I checked right here, church, none of you have been taken slave yet. I don't think any of us have been slaves recently. You may feel like your job is slave work, but you, know, you get paid, amen. Joseph didn't get paid. Um, so things are starting to go on the men for Joseph. He's now in charge of an entire household. He's doing well. Um, his master has pretty much left everything in his hand. It comes to the point, I mean, you think about this right here. Most of the time in those days, they were afraid that they'd wake up in the night with their stinking throat cut because their slave went and killed him. But this guy trusts Joseph so much that all he cares about is the food that he's eating on his table. That's all he knows about his household. Joseph is taking care of everything. So that's the amount of trust this man has in Joseph, and that's how powerful Joseph has become to this man who is captain of Pharaoh's guard. So he's a powerful man. And it looks like everything's going well. And sometimes, have you ever gotten that moment where like life is going so well and you're like, man, this is too good to be true. Something bad's going to happen soon, you know? And uh, man, doesn't that happen often? Uh, like, man, life is so wonderful and bam, all right? Ha and man, you get struck down right there, all right? And uh, verse 7 right here, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against my master? Did he say that? No, he said against God. Because he, he called it out, Hey, when we do wrong against someone, even against other people. We're, we're, are we doing wrong against them? Yes, but we're really doing wrong against who? God. Because God's the one that laid down the law in the first place about what we should and shouldn't do. And when we sin, church, you're, you may be hurting these people, or these, but you're really hurting God. You're really hurting God the most. And you're, you're going to answer to God in the end. You, you may answer to some you know, earthly people for temporary, but it's God you're going to answer to in the long run. When we all pass away someday and the judgment seat of Christ. But look at this right here. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. And he didn't, so this wasn't a one-time thing. She kept going after Joseph every single day. And again, I because uh, I'm, I'm going over something I talked to the teenagers a little bit. Being this powerful of a man, do you think he had a wife that was uh, ugly? No, he probably had a very beautiful, beautiful wife. And, jo and she was used to getting what she wanted. She was one of the most powerful women in Egypt. And Joseph could have used the excuse of, you know what, I'm a slave still, because he still was a slave. You know, I'll just do what she says. I'll just, uh, I'll just obey her like any other slave would do, and no one will find out. But he, but he knew it wasn't about other people finding out. He knew that God would know. He knew that God would know. And every time we sin, whether we do it out in public or in private where we think no one else sees us, God does. God sees us every time. And how can God use us if we're sinning in private as well? Because God knows. God knows. And do you think God would have been able to use Joseph in the end to save his entire family if he had willing, just been willing to just say, you know what, this once I'll compromise? I don't think so. Look at this right here. And verse 11, and it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came un unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice, and it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. Verse 16 of 39, and she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home 
And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now, had Joseph done anything wrong? No. But again, more bad stuff keeps happening to Joseph. Now he's accused by this wicked woman of trying to uh, assault her. And his master, who trusted him so much that he didn't care about anything except for the food on his table. But without a word, he grabs Joseph and takes him right to prison and throws him in the deepest, darkest cell in the king's prison. And again, folks, we're not talking about, you know, the prisons of nowadays. We're talking about old-time prisons, all right? So use your imagination a little bit. They didn't have nice little bunks, you know, and three square meals a day and exercise time and all that stuff. It was a lot less uh, uh, friendly back then. And uh, Joseph's master, look at verse 21. But the Lord was with who? Was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor (laughs) in the sight of of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And look at this, this seems like a repeat thing right here. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So we see again, Joseph coming in He's in prison. You think by now he's starting to get a little discouraged, but now Joseph is still deciding to make the best of a bad situation, still staying close to God, still realizing, God, I don't know what's going on in my life right now. I don't know why this is all happening. I don't know why I'm in another valley, God, but I know you're going to get me through it, and I'm going to keep a smile on my face, and I'm going to do, my best to make the be- uh, do my best to make the best of this situation. And someone else took notice again and put him in charge of over the entire prison and all the prisoners. And if you keep reading, look at 40. We're going to skip, kind of rush through this a little bit. But if you look at chapter 40, look at verse four, uh, chapter 40, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in the ward, and the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in the ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, verse 6, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore, look ye so sadly today. And if we keep reading about it, they tell their dreams to Joseph. The butler tells his dream. And, you know, it has something to do with uh, him squeezing grapes into Pharaoh's cup. And Joseph says, well, in seven days' time, you're going to be released, and you're going to serve King the Pharaoh again. And he's like, wow, that's great. And then the baker came and told his dream, and he had some baskets on his head with some breads and meats because he was the baker. And the birds came and took all that bread and meat out of his baskets. And Joseph said, well, bad news, buddy. And uh, I think it was three days' time. Yeah, three days' time, Pharaoh's going to lift your head off of your body. So, you know, yeah, I know. It went from a great dream to a bad dream in a real hurry right there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they were hoping he was wrong on that one. But... Joseph, look at this right here too. Look at, uh, after Joseph told the butler his dream, look at verse 14. After Joseph uh, pr- uh, told the butler that he would be uh, restored back to power underneath Pharaoh, Joseph made this request. But think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. And now, 
So Joseph makes a simple request of this butler, like, just remember me when you get back into power. Put a good word in for me. And I think he deserved it. He had served them for over a season, hand and foot. And then when they had a dream, he had interpreted that dream and correctly, as you'll see later on. But look at this right here. Look at verse 21 of chapter 40, 21 of chapter 40. And he restored the chief butler, talking about Pharaoh, unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Now look at verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but what? Forgot him. So again, just more of that bad, bad stuff coming into Joseph. He just neglected, forgotten, forsaken. And you know what? In prison, he must have felt really alone, just completely forgotten, thinking, I'm going to die in this place. Because that's probably what would have happened. He, he, was, he was doomed to live there forever until he died. And look at verse four, chapter 41. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And Joseph, uh, we'll read this part of the dream. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind, talking about cows, and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And then he has another dream about the same, about seven thin ears coming up and eating seven full ears of corn. All right, let's, let's look at verse 8. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do, do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream, and one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. Better late than never, I guess. Look at this right here, verse 14. Then Joseph sent <coughs> and called, jo then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, there is none that can interpret it. I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream and interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of what? <coughs> Everything that he'd gone through, and guess who still got preeminence in his life? God, God, God. Because Joseph realized that, with that without God all this time, he would have been, he would have probably killed himself a long time ago. Absolutely, just root, his life would have been gone a long time ago. But he kept God right in the midst of his life. He kept close to God through all of it. And, Joseph, and if you keep looking on here, Pharaoh tells him his dreams. Uh, Joseph explains it which is what this is going to happen is, Pharaoh, we're going to have seven years of great plenty in the land of Egypt. And then after that, there's going to be seven years of great famine in the land that the world's never seen before. And then Joseph gives them a plan. Hey, gather as much food as we can during those seven years. Gather as much food as we can so that those, when those seven years of famine come, we'll be ready to feed everyone. And Pharaoh says, sounds like a brilliant plan. Does anybody else think that he shouldn't be in charge? Silence, and Joseph was made, went from jailbird and the lowest of the low to second over all of Egypt in a matter of, what, hours maybe? Pretty incredible. I mean, this story just goes on and on on here, and I'm not going to read all of it for sake of time, but it's pretty incredible what God allowed Joseph to become in the end right here, how, and he was put over all of Egypt. And, and I'm going to mention this too. Guess who he ends up meeting again as second over all of Egypt when the famine comes? His brothers. His, brother, his brother's over in Canaan land, which is next to Egypt, and they're starving because there's, again, there's a seven-year famine going on, and their dad, Jacob, hears, hey, there's food in Egypt. So he sends the ten oldest brothers, the ones that wanted Joseph dead, who had sold him to slavery. He sends them out 
to go get food. And guess who they have to go ask food from? Joseph. Amen. So let me say this too. You got someone do you wrong? The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Stop trying. You can never do what God can do. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. David, he, have you read the book of Psalms? Come on. David, he, David had a lot of enemies, but David didn't try to like, take vengeance on him. He just left it up to God. But he, he gave God ideas of what he should do with his enemies. Amen. Cut their heads off, God. Do this to them. Make them weak. But, you know, he was brutal. But David realized and Joseph realized that, you know what? You know where, and when you read on later on, you don't see any bitterness, uh, hate toward his brothers. He, you know what? He, he, he tests them. He puts some tests in front of them. And if you want to take the time to read that, he does. But he wants to see if they repented of what they did to him. And they, and they, and they actually have. But nowhere do you see Joseph, like, you know, thinking about all the horrible things he's going to do. He could have. When they showed up to beg for food, he could have killed them all. I don't care. Oh, yeah, I'm a little horrendous yeah. of ways. But no, he, he showed mercy upon them because he realized, and you see in their lives too, they, they paid handsome. God took care of them big time. And church, if you got people that are, uh, this is kind of off top, but if you got people that you're angry against because they did you wrong, stop, stop being angry on them. Just give it to God. Let God, God can do a way better job being angry at them than you can, all right? And let him take care of it. And pastor talks about the, the drill sar- the, the sergeant that he dealt with in the army that used to give him such a horrible time for asking for church to have to be able to go to church um, every Wednesday and uh, would per- persecute him pretty hardcore for his, his faith and beliefs and stuff like that. And preacher just finally, at first preacher got really angry and really bitter about it, but then he finally just gave it to the Lord and God took care of that man big time. And he really did suffer because of it. And it, it, it's, it's a sad thing when Christians get bitter against people. Leave it to God, give it to God. Stop letting people and circumstances affect your spirit, ruin your spirit, make you ineffective for Christ, make you miserable. But go back to, we're going to finish out with this, Proverbs 25, 28. We're going to look at that one more time and we're done. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Joseph went through all these horrible things, but nowhere do we see him getting angry at God. Nowhere do we see him saying, uh, you know, speaking out about how much he hates his brothers how wrong they've been to him and stuff like that. If he had harbored hate in his heart for his brothers and, you know, was constantly thinking as he's shoveling, you know, getting whipped and, sh- and you know, working like a, working like being a slave, thinking about all the horrible things he'd like to do to his brothers, you think God would have been with him? No, not, no, not even remotely. But he had, he, had a forg- he had a forgiving spirit and he had a spirit of, you know what, God, you'll take care of it, not me. Yeah. And because of that, God was able to greatly use him to not only save his brother's lives, but the entire children of Israel. If he hadn't come, if he hadn't obeyed God and that famine would have come along and there had been no food, his family would have died. His family would have died. He, God used him to save his entire family's life, including his dad's life, his little brother's life, and all of their kids as well, all their kids and families. Why? Because he didn't let bitterness destroy him. He didn't let bad circumstances ruin his spirit. Verse 28 of chapter 25, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And this kind of goes back toward like medieval times and things like that. Back then, you didn't want to live in a city that didn't have walls around it because, uh, you know, that that really opens you up to a lot of uh, invasion kind of plans, you know. And that's kind of like us right here. What about you? How how high are your walls around you? Come on, that's good. In terms of your spirit. How protected is your spirit from outside forces? Or is it basically, man, you take a sip of coffee and it's not strong enough and that ruins your day? Is that, is that how pathetic, it, how easily your spirit can be ruined? Or how easily, you know, your spouse says something a little sharp, too sharp for your taste in the morning. And man, that just gets you started on a bad day right there. Or, you know, the pre- you come in Sunday morning and, man, there's no music. <laughs> Are you someone that, you know what, has no walls around your city, around your spirit, and just anything can come in and just ruin your day? 
that's a sad way to live as a Christian. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, then you're just you're 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 in trouble because you don't have the you don't have access to the peace that passes all understanding, and it yeah the joy, and it's it's a peace that you know what the money, TV, video games, cars, family, none of that can fill it. Only Jesus can, and only Jesus can fill that. And Christian, if you're, I mean, a lot, if you're not saved, you, you need that, first of all. You need to take that first step about getting that peace that passes all understanding. And no matter what you're going through, you can count on the Lord. I beg of you today, put a wall around your spirit. Put a wall around your spirit. Because we're, we're, we're in this life, and this life can be pretty awful. Yeah. This last week has, to, has taught me a little bit about that. I, I think about this right here. I think about Brother Weichel, who's going through a lot worse than I have. And it helps me understand how, why it's so hard for him to keep a good spirit. It's because of, I mean, the, the amount of pain that man is in. And during those times, we need Jesus more than ever. Amen. Because without him, man, it, you're just going to sink into a dark black hole and never get out of it. So I encourage you right here, build those walls around your spirit. And how do we build that wall? By being in the book, by being in prayer, being in a lot of prayer. Why does David say this? Early in the morning will I seek you. Because before we do anything that could mess up our day, we need to get on our face and get into God's word and read our Bible and pray and get those walls strengthened around us so that when we go in out and about, that nothing can touch us. Jesus says nothing can touch us. Nothing can affect us. Wife says a, a mean word. Husband says something unkind about Kristen's cooking the other day. I don't think it went over very well. She's like, I haven't even cooked since Tuesday. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, there's so many things out there that the devil will throw our way to try to mess up our day. Because people are watching. Joseph's, Joseph, had, you saw it, people, and Joseph's master saw him. And the keeper of the prison saw him. People are watching, church. And if you go to Saul Rock Baptist Church, people are going to take notice, and people are watching. And they are going to see, they, they want to see how your spirit is affected by things that they say and do as well. They're going to be seeing that. They want to see how you respond. So I encourage you, build the wall around that city, your spirit. Do not let bad circumstances affect you, because I don't think any of us have gone through what Joseph went through. If you have, come see me afterwards. I really want to hear that story, all right? <laughs> All right, well, I, I, th thank you so much for being here today. Um, we're going to pray, but again, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. I know it was a bit of an unusual service, um, but hey, it was still God's house. You still heard the word of God today, and uh, I encourage you to come back and uh, hear the pastor when he gets better, and hear our piano player as well. She's my wife, and she's pretty good. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and, I encur and lastly, before we go, Please, I beg of you, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you, you're trying to get through life without the one thing that will complete you and that will give you peace. Stop trying to do that. I mean, you, that all that misery that, you, that you're, you've been holding inside and stuff like that, let it go and give it to the Lord. The Lord, want, the Lord wants to take those burdens away from you. All you got to do is humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, ask him today to be your Savior. Give your life to the Lord. It will change you forever. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for you. God, you've been so good to us. And uh, God, I thank you for taking my cough away for the most part, Lord. What a blessing that was. And uh, God, I pray, Lord, now for our people, Lord. There's a lot of sick people today. I pray, Lord, you'll heal them. God, I thank you for the people that were here today. I thank you for our visitors being here. I pray you bless them. Go Lord, I pray, God, for all of us, Lord, to have a wall about our spirit, Lord. Help nothing to be able to bring us down, Lord, because we have you and we have our joy in you. Lord, help us to be in our Bible, be praying every morning before we go out and about in our life. Lord, if anyone's not saved in here, Lord, I pray you'll save them before it's too late. Help them to take that necessary step, Lord. Help them to come see someone after the service. We love you. We thank for you. Give us a great rest of the day. Bring us back tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, real quick, VBS, Vacation Bible School donation.